Hello? Am I on? My name is Edward Delgado Romero. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty and Staff Services and also a professor at the Mary Frances Early College of Education. 
I am happy to be here with you today, especially as we wind down a Latinx Heritage Month that, you know, without all, all of our parties and uh, getting paletas and all the things we used to do, doesn't even seem like it started yet. So uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to all get back together and celebrate. I know this weekend there will be Latinx Fest in Athens, and that will be live over Facebook Live, and so I hope that uh, there will be some way for people to connect and celebrate uh, the many cultures that we have. So anyhow, I am um, in the College of Education, Mary Frances Early College of Education, and I'm also a professor, a licensed psychologist, and I, I started and I supervise a Spanish language clinic uh, called La Clinica in La Quech. I'll tell you a little bit more about what that means. And most of all, though, I'm a son, and I know my mom is supposed to be watching, so hi, mom. Uh, sorry we got started late, but uh, I know you taught me not to be late, but here we go. A word about who Mary Frances Early was, for those of you who don't know, we just recently, before COVID, thankfully, uh, named our college after Miss Mary Frances Early, and uh, she was a, the first African-American graduate of, of uh, University of Georgia. Uh, and she was a graduate student, um, and if you've ever had the chance to meet Miss Early, you really uh, know that she is a wonderfully uh, kind, uh, generous person, and you just, when you're around, when I was around her, uh, I just felt this positivity. She's been through so much, she fought so hard to graduate, then was forgotten for decades, and now, thanks to uh, former social work dean Maurice Daniels, who discovered her story, and helped us all hear about her story. She has been uh, honored in this way, and I'm very thrilled that our college uh, bears uh, her name on it. I am part of a family, a multi-generational, international family. Hi, kids, uh, that you're watching. I told you one of these days I'd be a social influencer, and here I am. Well, my family is a big, sprawling, immigrant family and uh, love to all of you. My research team, I don't do this alone. I have one of the biggest research teams I think that people have. Uh, I have 42 graduates so far with the PhD uh, and our team collectively is known as Bien uh, and we work together to address uh, mental health needs broadly in the community. So a word about terminology. I know that uh, people have been debating, you know, what do you call a group of 60 plus million people? Well, some people say that it should be Hispanic. That's the official government term. Others say Latinx or Latino, Latina. Uh, there's all kinds of terms that come up. And I guess the thing to say is it's 60 million people and no, no one word is going to capture everyone. So I just try to get to learn to know about people and find out what do you want to be called and what, what, how do you experience the world. So don't get too hung up on terminology, that's what I say. However, at the same time, I would point out that Latinx is a term that rejects the gender binary in the Spanish language and is seen as more inclusive of LGBTQ folks in Latin culture. And for that reason, I think it's very important to uh, consistently use it. That's why I use it. So, UGA, we're the flagship institution in this state, uh, oldest college right in the country, that's what, what we hear. Uh, we're a big organism, there's a lot of us, there's undergraduates, there's graduate students, staff, our wonderful staff that keeps things going, faculty, administrators, alumni, and prospective students who want to come here. That's a lot of folks, and we're a big organism. So today I wanted to talk about how do we collectively work to help empower the Latinx community. One of the reasons why this is more and more important is population trends. Like I said, 60 uh, million, about 18% of the country right now. The projections are it's going to be about a quarter by the year 2050. As we know, projections are always off. We'll probably cross that mark a lot sooner than, than that. So we are going to be a country and I'll talk a little bit more about our state, where there are a lot of people with Latinx heritage. One of the things that we're seeing is there is a decline in the birth rates that is going to start showing up, meaning who's eligible to come to college. 
And I would think that, you know, all of a sudden we're all going to get very interested in people and make sure that they're coming to UGA. And uh, I think you'll find a lot of Latinx people who might want to come. In 2019, there are 60 million people estimated, 18% of the U.S. population. In the South is the, the largest growing region for Latinx folks with a growth rate of about 26%. In Georgia, uh, we're almost at a million. And at UGA, the student population is about 7% Latinx, and the faculty is about 2%. And when I did the math, because you know, 2%, well, how many is that? It's 34. Uh, 34 Latinx faculty. And so I, when I read that, it made me sad, and it also made me understand why I've been so lonely all this time. Uh, there's not many of us, but it's partly what I'm going to be talking about today. So one of the things I think about empowerment that's going to have to happen is that we're going to have to actively recruit, hire, retain, and promote Latinx faculty and staff. We need to have more uh, folks working at the university. We're going to have to recruit, uh, admit, and retain more uh, undergraduates and graduate students who are Latinx. And there you go. Wow, I can't read that at all <laughs> from this distance. My eyes are getting old. Um, so uh, let me kind of move a little closer for a second. All right. So at our university, we have a threefold mission, teaching, research, and service. So the first thing is about teaching. There aren't many courses that you can take at the university that specifically talk about Latinx culture and history. A lot of Latinx people don't even know their own history. And they don't know about the differences between the groups, that Puerto Ricans are U.S. citizens. They don't know that uh, because of war, uh, they, uh, the border crossed over a lot of people in what used to be Mexico and is now California and Texas, that Latinx people have been here from the beginning uh, of this country. So there's a lot that is missing from people's knowledge about what are Latinx people and their history uh, we may be relatively new to the state of Georgia, but we're not, we're not new to the, to, uh, to the country. So one of the th re ways that I try to help out is I've taught courses, I've created courses. I, I teach a, a Latinx mental health course. Right now it's being taught by one of my graduate students. And this is a dual level course that is both graduate and, and undergraduate. It fulfills Franklin College uh, requirement for the multicultural requirement. And the, the way that that happens is through my partnership with the Latin American Caribbean in, uh, and Caribbean Studies Institute. Um, also, uh, have, for the last eight years, I taught a first-year odyssey. It's the first year I haven't taught it in forever, but it was about Latinx issues, and that was a lot of fun to meet first-year students as they came into the university. I teach multicultural psychology in, in my program, the PhD in Counseling Psychology, and also through my supervision of other students and training of students uh, who are getting their doctoral degrees and their master's degrees it was one of the ways that I, that I can teach them about Latinx history. <laughs> oh, research. Research is very important for this university. Uh, we need to do more research with and about and in and, and cooperation with Latinx folks. And uh, we need to uh, look at uh, and, and involve students, like in programs like the McNair, uh, uh, Curo. We need to get these bright young minds focused on the problems of the day. And I think that working on Latinx research is going to be important, looking at the effects of things like COVID-19 and uh, how we can recover from that. I think we need to focus our research efforts on that. Whoa. Ooh. These good-looking people, and not, not, I do not include myself in the, in the, uh, in the statement about the good-looking people, are my doc students who have produced a lot of research about Latinx people. They've written their dissertations. They've done their master's uh, theses. They have presented at conferences. Uh, collectively, we've done a lot of work to create a, and add to the literature about what is known about Latinx people and what does Latinx mental health mean not just for anyone, but for example, for all, all people in the Latinx uh, society. So there's been a lot. Like I said, there's been, 
I have 42 uh, uh, doctoral graduates so far who have all studied in some way, shape, or form about Latinx issues. It's some of the research that we put out. Uh, if you go to my page on the College, Mary Francis Early College of Education website, you can look up some of these uh, articles if you're interested and you can read them if you'd like. Service. Service is big at this university. There are a lot of requirements for, for providing services, a lot of groups that want to help out, and I think it's really important that we provide quality service to the Latinx uh, community. And throughout our university, for example, at the law school, I partnered with Professor Cade, who runs the Legal Help Clinic, and we focus on immigration law as it applies and has to do with mental health. Uh, there's, a mobile uh, there's a mobile health clinic, Dr. Suzanne Lester through the Medical Partnership, uh, who provides free health care in a mobile setting to Latinx people. We work together. Uh, and from our own college, we have a dual immersion language school at Oglethorpe uh, Avenue. And that's Lou uh, Tulosa Casadon, one of my colleagues, who uh, we have a site out there where we're really focusing on and doing dual language immersion. There's a lot of service that's going on. So for us, for me, that has meant serving on school boards, being on the boards of nonprofits, uh, being in the Latinx community, and working with people, uh, uh, working together with communities, with hospitals, with lawyers, with everyone who w works in touch with school counselors, uh, principals. Um, it is a big community, and we have to work together with them. So I spend a lot of my time out in the community working with people to make them aware of Latinx issues or helping them solve problems that Latinx folks face. So one case example I'd like to talk to you about today is a place where I have attempted, along with my students, to integrate uh, t uh, training, service, teaching, and research. We started a clinic. When I became a full professor, I decided that there was really something I needed to give back to the community, and one of the things that I know that UGA has a lot of is exceptionally bright and motivated students who need real-world experience and who like to give back to the community. So I found a few students and we started a clinic where we would give away mental health services. Like we would primarily do individual therapy sessions, but also some assessment in the service of immigration cases. We got together and we started people. At first, we couldn't get anyone to show up. Nobody trusted us. They figured we would just set up shop and go away. Well, five years later, we haven't gone away. We went from 25 clients in one year to over 200, uh, and we were rocking and rolling. And then COVID happened. So we immediately had to pivot and change, just like you do here at the university. You had to change. We all had to change the way we interact, things we do. We had a physical building that was loaned to us by a church that, uh, that was really active uh, in serving the Latinx population. And so we had to decide what to do. We couldn't see our clients in a small room face-to-face -face anymore. So what did we do? We've been doing it virtually, trying to help people out. So we had to change. So the clinic changed from a, a, uh, a uh, brick place, a thing, a house, to now it's virtual. And we've been giving away a lot of services. All the clients that are seen at the clinic uh, are seen completely free of charge. And we're usually pretty booked. Um, so, but, and that's great. That's good for business. People who are bicultural, bilingual providers have a lot of challenges. Imagine not only having to uh, talk to people in a different language, but having to understand that language and then be therapeutic in that language. It's kind of a tall order. Not only that, if you remember, I told you there's 60 million people in the U.S. alone who are Latinx who come from very different countries and have different ways of speaking and expressions. And so just because I know Spanish doesn't mean I can understand someone who's sitting across from me. Uh, I don't know that I can understand their experience. Uh, I was privileged to have uh, a mom who brought me to the United States. We enjoyed uh, coming over here with citizenship. Uh, she worked hard. She put us through school. She was able to do that in the 1960s and 70s. It was a different world then. 
So as a bicultural provider, sometimes even though I'm same uh, ethnicity, same language, some of the same background, I don't necessarily understand what people are, are going through these days. And so there's a lot of challenges. Uh, people who are bi bilingual and bicultural might be expected to do a lot of service and to see a lot of the clients who are Latinx, but maybe not necessarily get rewarded to, for it. So if I was in private practice, I wouldn't get an extra bonus just because the session was in, in Spanish. So understanding these things, we pulled everything together to have this clinic. And we have, like I said before, we're completely free. We see people everywhere from little ones, about five years old to 85 year old is actually the oldest person who has come to get uh, counseling from us. Uh, we work with uh, all the, uh, the community agencies that, that help out with the clinic. We do a lot of advocacy. We work with uh, groups that advocate uh, for policies that are humane towards Latinx people and those people who may not have the documentation that you would like them to have. Um, we, we do a lot of things in the community and we also train now, we train social work students. Uh, we have people from psychology, uh, both undergrads in psychology and clinical psychology. And uh, we have various partners around the university. So my student said, previously it was called uh, the Bien Clinic. And they said, you know what, that doesn't really um, capture what we're doing here. And I said, okay, well, give me an idea. And they said, how about in La Catch? I said, okay, tell me what that means. And it's an, a oh my goodness. I'm, uh, it is a Mayan greeting and it is, you are my other me. If uh, I love and respect you, I love and respect myself. If I do harm to you, I do harm to myself. It's really our our philosophy of when we work with the community, we're not just working on them. They are also contributing to our lives and making our lives more richer. It's not just that community and our community, it's our community. And so this togetherness that we're talking about in In La Catch is something that we aspire to. So when you come to counseling, it's not I'm the, the doctor, you're the patient. It's we're here together to work on things. I have specialized training, but it's more about unity. It's more about collective uh, efforts to, to change society so that everyone is, uh, is doing better. So how do we empower the community? Um, and uh, I'm kind of moving back and forth because I, I put my PowerPoint and it's kind of far and I'm getting old and I can't read my own writing there. Um, hold on one second. Okay, <laughs> we work with the community, we work with providers, we work with families. Uh, there, you can read it for yourself at some point, but uh, we, we contribute a lot to uh, what goes on uh, with families. Uh, if you can uh, imagine, a lot of folks don't want to be found, don't necessarily want to be counted. And uh, <clears throat> one of the things that happens with Latinx immigrant families is that they usually come over in waves or what we call staggered immigration. And so these families have a lot of complex dynamics that go on. And so a lot, it's not unusual for us to go to the schools or to have to go to clinics. We have a partnership with Mercy Health Clinic, which is totally free care. Um, there's a lot of agencies involved in the care of a community and especially the community that doesn't necessarily want to be found. You have to go looking for them and then assure them that you can help them. Conversely, the community empowers us. It empowers my students, it empowers me. It gives us a sense that we're actually giving something back to the community. It gives a sense of fulfillment. Uh, we get hours towards uh, degrees, uh, can get hours towards license. Uh, it's part of my job in the College of Education. Part of my uh, obligation is to provide service. There's an outlet for us to put across all these um, skills that we've learned, adapt them, and use them for the benefit of others. And working with folks really makes my life better. 
uh, makes their life better and empowers both of us. So I guess in, in the end, the question that originally that I wanted to talk about was how do we empower them? But really, it's about how do we empower each other? Uh, and working with the community, some of you have volunteered in the schools or, or done things uh, like that, and you see that it's not just a one-way street, it's a two-way street. So, as a, as a summary, uh, we need more folks, not just Latinx folks, but people who are interested in the culture, people who speak Spanish. On my team, there, there are folks who, do not, who are not Latinx themselves, but who speak Spanish and who know about the culture. We need those folks. We need people to learn about the culture, and we need to recruit faculty, staff, students, graduate students, um, and we need to kind of bring more people to UGA. That is what I have to say today. So someone asked me what are some of the recruiting methods we could use to grow the Latinx community at UGA. Um, there are examples already. I mean, there's Movimiento Latino, where people all come together. Uh, the parents are also... Um, uh, for lack of a better word, it's not just recruiting the students, you're recruiting the family. You need to tell them and have them feel that, uh, that Athens is a safe place, that UGA is a safe place for their kid. Um, and you recruit the entire family rather than just the individual that's focused on, you know, the parents are really going to want to know what's going on. So that, the movimiento, it includes the parents. Uh, I know in the graduate school has been Dale, which has also been... A, 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 an attempt to do a more personal type recruiting for graduate students. And again, COVID-19 kind of short-circuited that one, but I'm sure that that will continue to go. Um, so that's, that's part of the recruitment. I think the recruitment of the whole family, recruitment of... of um, one of the things I see a lot is a lot of, of students coming to campus. And when I talk to them, they're middle, stu middle school students sometimes high school students, and who are Latinx. And what they'll say is, this is a beautiful place, this is a lot of fun, but I could never come here. And what we need to do is change the culture to say to them that, yes, you could come here, and yes, this is a place for you, and find out why do you think that you don't belong here, because you could, you could be here too. So another question I've just been asked is, what, how can we use our platforms to help facilitate discussions that will promote, promote inclusion for the Latinx community at UGA? That's a tough one right now, especially with us being kind of on lockdown and not being able to get together. One of the folks helping run this is a DJ talking about how, you know, uh, business is down. It, well, for Latinx people, you can't have dances, you can't get together, you can't listen to music. That's tough. Um, but I think, you know, using the social uh, media platforms is good to raise awareness of the issues, um, talking about things, and then when we get back together, it's attending uh, not only just UGA events, but community events. And I, what I like to say to students is, it'd be great if you can go into the community and not be there to help all the time, just be there, be a person, go to the store, see the, go to the grocery store, see what people are doing. Um, be, be seen and be part of the community so that people fe start feeling comfortable and not so isolated. Ah, so with Spanish being a foreign language that is offered at UGA, do you believe that a certificate could be created with the purpose of incorporating bilingual courses and training? I think that's great. I know that UGA does offer a medical interpreting uh, certificate, right? Uh, and we do have, throughout the years I've been here, I've been at UGA for 16 years, and we've had these events uh, that, you know, we, we started up a program here or a program there, um, but, yeah, I think that we could do that. In my experience, though, uh, it's interesting because all the technical Spanish in the world is not going to help you when you have someone who is not there for Spanish class. They're there to express their emotions, their feelings, their trauma. Uh, it does help to know Spanish, but I tell you that that is, I have yet to have a client correct me on my Spanish use. I'll say that differently. There was one client who did, but most people don't. And so it's really trying to use language and also understand emotions in language. And one of the things we know is that 
emotions are felt much stronger in our first language than they are in any language we learn subsequently. So there's so much to bilingual counseling and bilingual uh, ability other than just language ability. But could we start something? Heck yeah, this is UGA, we do innovation here, and, and there's a lot of places around the country that offer things, so why not us have us innovate and, and start a certificate in uh, bilingual, um, bilingual communication? That would be awesome, because again, technical Spanish, technical English are very different than what people use day to day. What would be some events or campaigns that would be meaningful for the Latinx community? So I'll give you an example out of the School of uh, Public Health and, uh, and a School of Social Work. Uh, one of my colleagues, Alejandra Calva, she was getting her master's in both an MPH and an MSW, and she started a campaign to get out and count and reach folks. And instead of this kind of you come to me approach, she uh, would send people out and go out herself to try to find where the Latinx people were and then approach them to try to get some data about uh, the population and about their issues and stuff. So I think right now, expecting people to come to our labs or expecting people to come to campus and to, be, uh, to then learn about them that way, it's not really going to work. Most people don't feel pretty intimidated coming to this campus. That's why my clinic originally was by the mall, and then now it is, it's uh, fairly close to campus, but off campus in a house. And so I think that that has helped is because it breaks down this idea that you're going to the hospital or you're going to see, uh, you know, in a waiting room. The waiting room that we have is just a big old family room. And when people walk in, it doesn't feel clinical, sterile, that kind of thing. So I think breaking down the barriers to getting health care, to getting mental health care, being seen in the community. I've had many people come up to me and say, you're the first Latino psychologist that I've ever seen. Um, and it, it, it is pretty humbling uh, because to them, they imagine some, somebody with a long beard, someone with a, with a big sofa or something, but something that doesn't really apply to them. Uh, and so seeing people who have families like myself, who are part of the community like ourselves, um, it's, in, it's important uh, uh, for us to be seen and understood also that although I have a, a license as a psychologist and a doctoral degree, I'm still part of the community, breaking down the town and gown division. For other minorities on campus, how can we support our Latinx brothers and sisters in our fight for social justice issues? This is another one of these things that goes both ways. Uh, one of the ways that we can support people is to show up for each other. Other ways to address the divisions within our own community, talk about homophobia in the Latinx community, talk about the situation of Afro-Latinx people that are often forgotten or maybe assumed to be African-American or assumed to be this or that, but they're actually both. Um, I think showing up for each other at each other's events, um, speaking up for each other in classes, if, if something is being... Uh, taught to you that isn't correct or maybe a microaggression is some type of insult and cut standing up for each other and saying no, that that's not going to be something that's uh, allowed to happen. Looking for common ground. Um, there's uh, immigration issues are not unique to the Latinx community. We share a lot of immigration uh, issues and concerns with very many different people. And so I think getting together, finding those commonalities uh, being there for each other, helping each other in terms of events, recruitment of, of you know, I'd love to see faculty from all uh, backgrounds, not just Latinx. So it's Latinx Heritage Month, so I'm going to focus on that slice. Selfishly, I'd like to see, but I also am thrilled when I see people from all different groups. Is it? No more questions? Like my mom didn't have a question? <laughs> All right, well, thank you very much, and I hope that, uh, that you, uh, you heard some things that you might like to get involved. There's a lot of different ways to get involved at UGA. Uh, there's a lot of ways to support people, um, and, I, and I hope that if you're interested in working with the Latinx community or maybe you're someone who has been interested in this field of doing something but you've never kind of uh, gotten the courage up to talk to a professor or a graduate student or something, 
just email me, edelgado at uga.edu. Talk to my students. Um, you know, we'll be glad to talk to you and break down those barriers. People often ask me, how can I help with the clinic? Because it's a confidential service, there's not a lot of ways that you can help. However, there are ways in which we can raise funds, <coughs> raise awareness. Um, uh, there, there are ways to help, but sometimes not as directly. Uh, but there is, uh, it's important for everyone to be aware of the issues. So thank you to MSP for having me as part of this series. And uh, I hope you enjoy the last week of uh, Latinx Heritage uh, Month. And remember, the Latinx Fest for Athens is this Saturday. and It's on Facebook Live.